Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. Welcome to MSID Fat, welcome to our YouTube channels, and welcome to the world of direct field acoustic testing if you've never been in it. Uh, my name is Alessandro Carrella, or Alex, as most of um, my colleagues and friends call me. Um, if you haven't met me yet, then you can use Alex, because it's probably the short and easiest way to call me. Um, I work at MSID FAT. Um, we'll get back to that in a, in the next webinar. I just want to um, have here an introduction. I want to take you, uh, introduce you to the world of DFAT. It is the first um, of a series of webinars. We'll do more um, with my colleagues in, in, at uh, MSI. We will go through a number of technical uh, topics, uh, more generic topics. So, but before getting into that, I just want to start from, from really from the very beginning um, of, of this world. Uh, is a world that applies most of our uh, test and and, uh, and business to that of the space industry. Um, what what we do is um, really to prepare for this. So this is all what we we prepare for in our in our business. The separations of the different stages until um, we get into uh, into orbit. This is a view of inside the fairing. This is what the satellite look like when the fairing is open. Life separation before eventually the satellite um, is released. And you can hear, I don't know if you hear it, but it's actually very quiet. So from now on is years and decades of, of quietness. So there is there will be some micro vibration issues, but it is so launch is really what we prepare for. Um once satellite is is out there is doing its job on orbit, in orbit then it will be less of a harsh environment. So before getting to um to that point the OEM, um, when it comes to a, a satellite or component, has to go through a number of uh, test requirements. And these are set by the launch authority, so by the launcher that you decide to, to use. Um, it can be uh, Ariane, it can be SpaceX, they all have a, a user launcher manual, and you will see that there is some, some specific test to be uh, to be executed, and acoustic is one of them. So there is a sine vibration, there is a shock test, uh, then for component there is a random, there could be a random. So there's different. The test campaign is pretty is pretty long and extensive. So all is to make sure that when you launch when you launch a satellite, the the, the risk of damage is is pretty much uh, been assessed and and eliminated. So in what we do at MSI DFAT is a specific part of this test campaign, which is the acoustic testing. So let's look more in detail about this acoustic testing in the space industry. Um, again, the launcher manual the, is, the, the, is the, the, the book that prescribes and tells us how to, to run this test. They are the one that has taken us for um, to, to space, so they will have um, they will work with, with the OEM engineers to, to run a couple of the analyses to understand what kind of profile to run, what kind of spectrum. But they, so they, they, they tell uh, pretty much, they run the show in terms of saying what is that has to be done. And there's always very interesting discussions between OEM engineer, tech engineers, and, and launch authority uh, for the level, for the notching. But anyway, so in this book, there, there is, uh, there's a lot of information for uh, carrying out the tests that they need to be carried out. And for example, the Ariane, all the, the, the Ariane is passed, so the European launchers, they have a very specific um, description of the acoustic field. And so the applied acoustic is, diff is diffuse. Something that um, I actually haven't uh, found in any of the other manuals um, um, in the European, uh, other than the European uh, launchers. So 
I went through the Delta, the Falcon, the Atlas, and I couldn't find, so there is a spectrum, there is the whole spectrum, and um, but I couldn't find any specific uh, requirement for diffusivity or the, the field there to be diffused. But it was an interesting um, information that I, I found by looking at different, different manuals. Um, what do I mean in practice? In practice, the launcher provide a spectrum. It can be third octave, it can be full octave. I have seen that um, for some reason in Europe there is more full octave definition and in the state there is more uh, third octave. So in Asia there's also um, a full octave. Um, but again, it is, there, is, there, is, um, there is one of the two. So there is always a table of uh, frequency band and SPL, so sound pressure levels. And until now, um, for the past four decades, um, the the scope of these tests were to make sure that the average of a number of microphones in a reverb chamber would meet the spectrum within certain tolerance. So there would be four, eight, twelve microphone averaged, and then the average microphone that would be compared to this uh, spectrum that has been assigned by the authority by the launcher, and we will see if the test is passed. So th that is um, what has been um, until now. Um, the practice. For the first time, IDN6, which hasn't flown yet, but um, is is prepping up the um, again the, the launcher manual is the the, the main uh, re reference for any anyone who wants to launch um, with a specific uh, vector. So the IDN6 has, for the first time, introduced a. Um, uh, a line, a statement that says, in case the direct field, please contact Iran Spas. So there is already now, for the first time, a acknowledgement that direct field acoustic can be a means of testing. And there is also, for the first time, a criterion for homogeneity um, of the field, something that has not been done before, because before it was done in a, a reverb chamber. So, um, well, we can go into details of the lower frequency of reverb chamber, but in general, uh, a reverb chamber is designed to be uh, uniform, um, provide a diffuse and, and uniform field above a certain frequency, but below, um, but not below that that cutoff frequency. But anyway, there was never a requirement for uniformity because it's assumed that the chamber does provide that uniformity. Now, with direct field acoustic being explicitly mentioned, and given um, the history and, and the past and the, the, the questions and the papers written on, on the subject, then Arian 6 has decided to to provide an extra criterion, which is very very interesting. There is still some just some, some work to be done in terms of specifying and helping the the, the community, but it is a very good, um, is a very welcome and, and, and great addition to to the test to the launcher to the launcher manual. Um, so there is a um, to, when it comes to to space testing, there is always a, um, a some standards or something, um, some reference to follow that are issued by the agency. So JAXA has some European agency, as has the EXMET, um, the ESCCS book. Uh, NASA has um, his own handbook and, 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 and material to, to guide uh, test engineers. Uh, in 2016, uh, NASA and JPL and Ali Kolaini um, issued his first handbook is um, a, a reference for the time being because there is nothing else available. In 2008, um, we held a, uh, a, a panel of experts at the, at the conference in ESA, the Exmet conference in 2018. At the end of it, it was very clear that the industry and, and, and the community was ready to, to embrace more and understand more of direct field acoustic in, in Europe. And so the European Space Agency has, um, has very um, readily approved a working group which has the remit of uh, writing a first handbook for, for, for Europe, for the, for the agency. So we are working on that. So we are, um, uh, we are meeting uh, regularly, trying to, uh, to synthesize and come up with a, a book that is a so the, the, the direct field, so the NASA 7010 that you see there on the screen is being written in the seven, in 2016, and six years ago technology was very different. There was um, there was a lot of things, there's a, a lot of um, improvement that have been put out in the field. So 
uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's time to you know, for the European Space Agency and and NASA to, to to upgrade and to have the latest and greatest um, findings and literature on the subject. But why? I think because how do we do why and how do we do this acoustic time? So there is two. So acoustic time is two main reasons. One is the acoustic loading. So there is need of reproducing the acoustic loading uh, that happens in the fairing. So a technician, uh, the soundborn uh, vibration, um, the, the structure vibration borne by uh, the sound outside are transmitted to, to, to the satellite. So this is something that has to be reproduced. That's the whole point of an environmental testing to reproduce, um, trying to reproduce the effect of these uh, this environment, uh, environmental condition. And second, to measure and monitor the structure when it's subject to this um, to this loading. Now, there is a, um, as I said earlier, a standard way of testing, which is in reverberant chambers. These are uh, reverberant test, uh, uh, reverberant field acoustic test, or RFAT sometimes uh, is defined, is something which is accepted and proven. Um, this happens in specifically built chamber, um, which are um, there, there are not many in the world, but there are um, they are being used uh, to test small and big satellite components. Uh, there is a lot of uh, pro and cons. We will see in a second. But um, the question is, um, is this the only way of doing? So today there is this, and 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 now we have another way of doing it, which is the direct field acoustic test. So direct field acoustic test, just to give you a snippet, direct field acoustic test is a test carried out by uh, means of loudspeakers um, placed in a circle around the surround the test item so to reproduce um, the, the requirement from the launcher, which is a uniform and diffuse field. Um, the, the challenges to do these are multiple, as you can imagine. Um, size, levels, uh, technology is, is obviously expanding um, rapidly and, and something that is now available to, to, to use as an alternative to, to the vibrant chamber. Um, just um, to, to give you an idea how this started, this started back in the 90s, late 90s. Um, the, the, the industry, and you will see in a second on stand and stand on why, the industry was very interested in in finding an alternative or a new way of testing. So as a timeline, uh, the first test was um, somewhere in around late 90s. Um, MSI was called in, um, at the time was JPL, uh, an orbital, uh, they, they got together and they, they wanted to, there was, there was a, a discussion like, hey, why don't we try to make noise with speakers? Why don't we you know, we we find a new way, or we go away from from chamber, and we're trying to get the speakers? And um, at the time, MSI was uh, was called in, so um, and the president Bob Goldstein, obviously as enthusiastic as he as he is, said, sure, why not? Let's do it. And then that's how it started. Um, they started with experimenting with control, with meso control, uh, random control adapted to acoustic. And it's been a long way, a lot of um, speaker, you know, if you have a, I, I was one of the, the lucky one to attend a Paul Larkin. I don't know if you remember Paul Larkin was a MSI DFAT, uh, my predecessor at MSI. And he ran seminars and the amount of, um, of the speakers and, um, and coil barn is, is extraordinary. So it's been a long way, a long, um, you know, long, a steep landing curve. Um, eventually, as a timeline, you can see, uh, in, 20, um, in 2018, a new controller, so just after the, the release of the 7010, a new controller, uh, an upgraded control capability came out, a MIMO rectangular. Uh, at the same time in, in Europe, there were, um, I was working uh, with, the space, with, with, with the space community in Europe and we qualified a satellite in Europe. Uh, ESA started to uh, approve um, the working group uh, works to write a handbook, and eventually in 2022, we are today where um, where Ariane 6 has introduced, has added a statement on DFAT on its 
um, on its launch manual, and we have qualified. I think we keep a tally and more or less precise, and we are about 185, 100, between 180, 190 satellites qualified in in the U.S. with DFAT. So it's pretty impressive. So uh, that's how long the technology has taken to to develop. Uh, but let's um, let's go back to the first question. Why did he start? How did DFAT? Um, so I always call DFAT as, as a, um, a business development technology more than a, a, a technology need. Um, the, the, the chamber could perfectly test um, to acoustics, um, could perfectly satisfy the requirement of acoustic testing. But there was a business. There is a business need. So if you look at the map of US, there are um, you can see on the screen there are uh, four blue dots and a yellow dot. Um, so the yellow dot is somewhere here, uh, that's in Ohio, and that's a NASA um, Plumbrook, um, that's an Armstrong facility, test facility. Um, and then these blue dots here, there is a Sunnyvale, Lockheed, there is El Segundo, Boeing, there's also Redondo Beach here, Northrop. There is Northrop Grumman down in, um, in Gilbert, Arizona, and there is Lockheed Martin again here in Denver. So these are uh, chambers which are large chambers. I'm only I'm listing only the large chamber, more than 50,000 cubic feet, or about 1,300 cubic meter. So these are these are large chambers. So you can imagine that anyone building a satellite or some space component here has to go a long way to to go in in one of these chambers. And even here, so for example, up here in in Palo Alto, there is Maxar Space System Rural at the time. Maxar now um, that they had no chamber, so they had to go to a, a competitive uh, outlet. So whether it was lucky, there was so th there is a small chamber down in Santa Clarita, but it's a small chamber. Um, so th th the the idea of testing big satellite in big chambers is obviously um, requires some some logistic efforts. Uh, on the other hand, in Europe, there are um, four chambers. Europe is obviously uh, a lot more contained, um, especially than U.S. is. And so the, f the four biggest chamber are in Northwark at the European Space Agency. There is uh, one in Toulouse. Uh, there was used to be Interspace, now it's Airbus. There is Cannes, which is Thales Salenia, and there is IABG uh, in Germany, Munich. Now, two of these are public test house, and two of these are uh, owned by a, a company. So one is uh, Airbus, and the other one is Thales. So you can see how... Uh, in Europe, there is uh, there is a more access to this facility. You, you could, um, wherever you are in Europe, you can find a, a test facility, uh, an acoustic chamber, which is not too far. So you can understand why in the States there was a push. Um, but just to give you an idea um, about the logistics, um, this is this is a video from um, from the U.S. military. That's um, I would, you know, contact tower. Have a good day. Okay, 578, switching towers here. Alright, runway well, heading up to 10, or 10,000 initially. Yeah. MCO rolling, pushing it up. We're going to be traveling from Travis Air Force Base to Moffett uh, Airfield in San Jose, California to preposition for a satellite upload. As is in the C-5 community, Travis Air Force Base is the only base that has C-5s capable of moving satellites around the country. Uh, approach checklist. So in order to prepare for these space missions, we have to, as an air crew, be very cautious and very and prepare much more thoroughly in regards to turbulence, in regards to weather, because it could damage the, uh, the satellite. So yeah, the C-5 uh, specifically has special hookups for these uh, satellite containers that we carry around the world. So I I let you watch you know the, you can the video is in the, you, you can continue watching the video, um, but you can understand you 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 do realize the the amount of logistic preparation necessary to 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 move a satellite. So um, the, the 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 transport the the care the 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 risk and and again the risk is a um, so there is a lot of money. You can imagine the money involved in this. So the crew has to move with satellite, uh, the, the special requirements for satellite. But you can imagine the risk. So this is a binary thing. So 
if everything goes well, sure, you get to the facility. If something goes wrong, is you know, you are mission failure. So mission is failed. Uh, the window, the launch window is is, is over. So th there is a lot of um, uh, of risk, and and quantifying the risk is actually pretty impossible. So you could quantify the cost. You could you know sum up okay, transportation, insurance, cost of engineering. You can put all of these. Uh, but the risk is something you cannot quantify because again it's binary. If you anything happens, uh, you, you know this goes through road, it goes through a, through a, through a truck, from the truck to a plane. Um, m most cases, there's not even plane, so planes is even more expensive. But it, it goes through on, on a on a specific truck on a, on, on road. And um, I've been talking to people that had to transport large things, and especially in the states. Um, I guess there's in Europe something similar, but in the states. Every state that you cross has a specific, as a special road rules, and so you have to have a special transportation and a special rule with escort in each in each state that you go through. You can imagine that uh, you know the cost just spirals, um, spirals out of um, spirals out of control very quickly. So this is a very expensive um, test to do, and therefore uh, the DFAT one uh, appeal. And so the, the 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 economic and the business side of it, we come to wherever the satellite is. So the alternative is now uh, real, is there. We go every, you know, every other week, more or less, we go out testing. Uh, whether it's for a component, so you can see on, on the left a small setup for component, or you see the, the, the ESM, the European Service Module of the Orion mission on the right at, down at the Cape. So, you know, th th there is no more um, uh, structure size. I mean, obviously, there is, there is a limit to, to how tall we can go. We are about 40, 50 feet. We can go. Um, we can put stacks up. So there is um, there is still um, advantages in terms of uh, technology advantages. So th there is um, there are small things. We will go through the, some more more technical webinars. But for example, how fast we go to to, to level in a chamber. You have to wait for the chamber ramp up time. We're looking at 15, 20 seconds if it's a good chamber. So for 15, 20 seconds, the satellite is exposed to a lot of noise. Um, that goes from zero all the way to, to the test level. Uh, we do it in the fact in a lot quicker, in, in a lot shorter time. Um, we have the advantage of not suffering from shredder frequency or cutoff frequencies because we can we can control a very uniform field down uh, from 20, 25 hertz. So that's another. But again, these, these are technical things. We will. I just want you to. I will leave you with with a message that. Um, all that expensive trips on planes and trucks and, and insurance is now removed by uh, us um, coming on site, setting up um, stacks of speakers, whatever told they need to be, and and then and then qualify your satellite as per requirement of the launch satellite. Uh, there is a bunch of pro and cons. You can you know you can pause when you look at these. You can. You can download. You can you can magnify it. But um, again, the the main um, the, the main benefit is the main reason why this was born is out of a uh, of a business need. We we really cut the cost of the program uh, by by a double digit percent point compared to transporting. Um, and risking. And again, when it comes to risk, then you know that there is no it's the peace of mind of staying home. Uh, in your lab and getting the satellite done uh, is as little. Um, there is no there is no way of quantify that advantage. Um, so once you you know we framed uh, a bit where the technology uh, comes from. What is the technology? Why is the technology? Let's look in, again without going any much or any detail. Um, what is the a DFAT? So. A DFAT system is a combination of, of two things, a control with its hardware and software and an acoustic excitation system. Um, there, is, uh, there, is no, uh, 
dividing them. So both of them have to work uh, have to work hand in hand because um, the controller has to make sure that the field is uniform and is diffuse, and the excitation system has to make sure that uh, there is no uh, no feedback into the control loop and that there is uh, the system is controllable and they reach the level they have to be reached. On one side, on the other side, the, the stacks go up. Uh, easily, quickly, and safely, and don't fall on the satellite. So it's really a combination of the two. And MSI DFAT has been doing this from day one. Uh, we we manufacture, we design, we manufacture our speakers, we design our controller. Uh, the algorithm is our, so the, the, the MIMO acoustic controller is, is an MSI um, development, and and they all work together to maximize and optimize the, the two the two components of these. Uh, the result is a an acoustic field which looks, um, you know, you you can tell apart from a, from from an, a from a vibrant chamber test. Uh, whether you look at it in the full octave and third octave, the tolerances are met. The average of the we control on 24 microphone, so uh, the, the 24 points in the volume in, in the test volumes are controlled to the spec to to. to to what the requirement is. Uh, this is something that is obviously uh, unprecedented in the industry. It is a leading edge. We are at the leading edge of, of technology here. And and then th therefore there is all the satellites that we qualified have passed and we managed to, to qualify to spec every customer that we have uh, worked with. Um, there, there is been, as I said, a, a, a huge learning curve and improvement in technology uh, that goes from a um, the test duration that you know uh, if you look at the at the at the handbook or if you talk to somebody that's been using this technology in the past they would ask questions about oh can you can you run for six seconds or you have to cool off yes now this has been done we have a new technology that allows to test to run uh, 60 seconds 120 seconds without interruption Actually, we, we have run our component test level um, for acoustic fatigue at 140 dB for two hours. So speakers running for two hours, that's how efficient uh, technology is, is gotten. So we have uh, a new system with new amplifiers developed specifically for uh, for this application, and we can run um, two hours test at 140 dB without question. Um, it is... So there is a lot of when I started in this business, I was using off-the-shelf um, commercial loudspeakers, and you know also MSI was doing the same. Um, Bob Goldstein and MSI had enough equipment that uh, have diverted some of them to to these, but only to realize uh, more or less quickly that the the, um, the design of um, of entertainment loudspeakers is made to optimize certain uh, frequency bands, certain sound. Obviously, you don't want to hear that uh, shh sound when you're having a concert or somebody playing music. Uh, that shh sound is happens about between 150, 200, and, and 400 hertz. That, that sound that uh, they so they try all their best to eliminate the sound. Well, no surprise in in direct field acoustic that's where the peak levels are. So the, in in most of the spectrums, if not all of them, I've seen. There's always a peak level at 150, 200 hertz. So that's where the speakers of DFAT have to output the most energy. That's where off-the-shelf speakers are are designed to suppress that. So you can run it. I run it, and you, you could, uh, in principle, think of running it, use it. But they're not designed for it, which means that they are under stress. Then the amplifier are under stress. There is a number of things that we will see again in a more technical um, webinar. Uh, why um, the, the, an acoustic design, um, optimized acoustic design, helps uh, helps the the system to work. Uh, there is uh, there is um, ergonomical thing that the, the way the, um, the cabinet of amplifiers are transported. Uh, we have designed our own cabinet of amplifiers. We can we can fit 24 amplifiers in the rack and then wheel it around. Um, portable. That's something that you wouldn't think. Unless you do this every day, um, how to how to ballast your in a very efficient way your your stack of speakers. So you have a stack which goes up um, 10 meters, you know, 30 feet, and 
the only thing, you know, the last thing you want is this to fall because somebody knocks it or there is some earthquake. Earthquake could be a, a reason why, you know, the ground shakes and this doesn't have to fall. So everything has been designed. Um, so the steel, a lot of the framework, we call the framework these speakers are um, are attached to. Uh, there is uh, there are outriggers. Outriggers are um, you can at the base they they um, they, they stretch out to, to to provide stability, vertical stability. And on top there is a ballast, and the ballast is what used to be a, a transport car. So the transport car becomes a ballast. So th these are a few hundred pounds of weight. They make sure that the the stack of speakers don't tip over. So th there is a lot of um, you know the, how the, the the control room is set up. You know, we, we come up with our trolley, we open up. There's a lot of thinking behind that goes into a DFAT. You know, it's not just a speakers and making sound for for satellite. So uh, we have, um, as I said, designed specific set of speakers. MP stands for uh, Matt Polk. Matt Polk, yes, the guy from Polk Audio. Matt is one of the co-founder of. Um, and, and the main owners of, um, together with Bob, of, of MSI DFAT. And he has designed the speakers, as I said earlier, with, with the purpose of uh, maximizing and optimizing the sound um, that we we need uh, for, for, for satellite testing. And there is also a an, an additional, so as I said earlier, component testing is a part of of the qualification. Some, mostly it's not, um, it's not yet the space Component testing is a smaller component testing, and they get excited to a, a lot higher frequency than uh, that the 10 kilohertz that uh, we 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 are used to. So we have spectrum, we run spectrum up to 30 kilohertz, and these speakers, so these um, uh, high frequency, is HF2. These are specifically designed to excite. It's very directional. This is like a late, like you know, this is a sound beam um, to to excite uh, frequency above. Uh, above 30 to 20, 30 kilos. So this is uh, this is our own design, our own manufacturing down in Baltimore, um, and and puts us really ahead of of um, of everybody in this field because again we have been doing this for 20 years, and and again everything that has been uh, done is because of our crew. So if you have met Sally and and the crew, you know uh, the efficiency they require. So they come off the truck. And they have to stack them up very quickly, very safely, and so everything has been designed and built uh, for them to work. And obviously, if they have to do it every day, there is a lot of um, uh, care going into the. So th th this little yellow thing that you see here, this lift frame, is a specifically designed and built frame that makes sure that when you lift it with a crane, it doesn't tilt. Because you, you you can imagine this is like a very tall stack. Once it's is, is prepared and and then you has you have to lift it in place, or you have to open the circle, or you have to handle it. You know, it is enough that you know it is a bit out of balance, and the weight can 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 create some some issues. So everything is being taught and and designed um, with uh, with the most uh, care in mind. I leave you with some examples. Again, we have been doing this for 20 years. There is a lot of tests. Um, 185 that I, I said at the beginning is the count, um, and and more to come. Um, it is a it is a team MSI. We will do also. Uh, actually, I have intention of running one of these presentations, this webinar on our channel, um, to to introduce the members of the team. It is a very focused team, so with the most experienced. You know, once you work um, with, with with the Sally and and the team. You will really learn about DFAT. You will learn about um, how to set up speakers, what levels to put, from somebody that has been doing this over and over and over for 20 years. Um, the test engineers that come on site, whether it's Alan Merrick or it's West Main, Alan Merrick has been uh, working in, in space labs for, with Lockheed Martin and Space System Royal for the past 40 years. So there is, there is very few people that know about space testing more than him. Wes was a um, one of the designers of many of the acoustic chamber, so we really have a dedicated team um, to to run um, tests to develop technologies, and so we, we will do a we will do a seminar. We'll, we'll introduce to um, to the team. Um, I will leave you with that. So I will I, will, I can only thank you for your time. Um, of course, here's a, an info at msidefat.com. Please let me have any question. 
Let me know if there's a topic you'd like to, to, to hear more, if there's a specific question that, you know, next time I will address it. And I want to collect uh, this information. Um, you, you have um, all my contact. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you, can, you can reach me, and I will be very, very happy to interact with you and then to take you through uh, the next steps and, and the details of this technology. Thank you, and we will we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Enjoy the channels, watch out the videos, and you will learn a lot more. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.